The Tangent Egg Podcast is aimed at a mature audience. It contains themes that are not appropriate for all listeners. It's important to note that we are not experts. We routinely have no idea what we're talking about and are just three idiots sitting around a table. Listener discretion is advised. Quick note from editor Seth here. With all the uh, turmoil that came with Ben leaving and everything we had to do to get things sorted after that and then John Doe starting, we kind of forgot to announce who won the Ukraine bundle. That person is Tom, by the way. We're going to be contacting you soon and getting the prize to you, which we very much hope you'll enjoy. Now, on with the show. Okay, this is the third time we've done this due to technical difficulties. Welcome to the Tension Edit <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> it's We're doing Seth, well today. and Jondo here. And I believe Swoosh has got something he wants to start the episode with. Uh, primarily, I just want to have a bit of a collective chuckle at Disney finally maybe losing the rights to Mickey Mouse. Because... Fuck them and everything they stand for at this point. Like, going through animation and that kind of stuff, we learned a lot about Disney and Warner Brothers and all that fun stuff. And some of the fun facts you learn are, A, Walt Disney had one of the largest submarine fleets in uh, the US at one point. Which is and so fucking weird. It's so fucking dumb. And two was the fact that, you know, Disney has been messing with our copyright laws for so long so they don't have to lose uh, Mickey Mouse. And recently they, they lost Steamboat Willie, the precursor. That finally hit public domain because I'm assuming someone in the counting got lax and didn't pay you know, some sand or somewhere to extend it again. But now that timer is coming up for Mickey Mouse and they can't renew. <laughs> the local, that goddamn the local governments aren't letting them renew. They're yeah. actively going against it as well as all of their current land rights that they've got there so oh yeah well they can act as a sovereign state essentially absolutely they poked the fire and now they're getting burned well I mean they can only get away with it for so long it really was some pretty egregious shit it has taken so long it, already how has it taken this long for it to happen though yeah it, it's been left alone for far too long like they had to have been paying a few people like, just, just don't look in this direction it's fine nothing's going wrong but the weird thing is, uh, all the stuff that's been leaked from employees of like Disney World and Disneyland and that kind of stuff, and what happens. Uh, one of my favorites is the uh, was Aladdin prerogative, which is uh, by the you know the ruling of Disney on their parks, no one is to um, lose a life. You can't murder anyone, uh, even to defend others, except for Aladdin's prerogative, which means the guy who plays Aladdin is allowed to murder people if justified by Disney such a weird thing right who why thought Aladdin that? we need to let someone be able to murder people and protect everyone who should it be Aladdin yeah that'll work none of the other it, like actual fighting things we have Aladdin no. or any of the other knights or any of those sort of characters not the nah. street rat well if you look his character's already tarnished he's already a, a, a street thief he's already a liar he cons his way to get into the tower so of course he's gonna be the only one that can kill true and everyone needs a street thief hit squad. Yeah, true. compelling argument there. Does that mean he's a one man street gang? Well, him and his monkeys. No, sorry. Yeah, two man. Like, he's one and a half. Him and a monkey. <laughs> well, if you think of any other major Disney character, none of them have got the same sort of background where they're already thieves, or none that I can think of off the top of my head, anyway. Short of Stitch, who's made to destroy. But he's the only one true. who could have the character to kill in theory in Disney off camera death anyway unless you're a big bad true, guy right? and falling off a building yeah there have been some inadvertent deaths in Disney but nothing uh, nothing that's been straight ahead like I know it's not it's Disney now but before it was Disney I think it was Pixar but who made Up was it Pixar that was Pixar yeah the, the death in Pixar was amazingly well done well, like, that's because they made you like the characters in less than 10 minutes and then was like, one of them's dead. Oh no, not just that. The death of the villain. It was sharp and quick. There was no, yes. oh, he's going to survive. It was, no, he has plummeted to his death. Yes. No, yes. if, buts, maybe, that is done. Fuck. And that started the trend of Disney doing brutal stuff. Yeah. And then we started seeing more and more brutal deaths of villains from Disney. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a... I think they learnt a little from Pixar because Pixar really 
has that ability to make those really like for lack of a better way the way you put it like sharp deaths like mm. you feel it and I think that's kind of what Disney's been kind of missing at least more recently maybe not when they back when a lot of the movies that people think of as Disney movies were made and those deaths were a little softer they probably played a little better then but you know now people like that definitive like comeuppance have been had yeah the, a lot of the older Disney movies, they take a whole movie to make you love and enjoy a character, whereas Pixar mm. do it in a 10-minute gap and suddenly you're invested in this character. There's their whole life in front of you. So uh, the death in a Pixar movie almost has to be short and sharp to say, this is dead. It's over. Yeah. Like your yeah. 10 minutes you of emotional it. turmoil is mm. done, whereas old Disney took an hour and a half to make you look at this character and go oh my god I've lived I've lived this hour and a half with you and this is your mm. story I actually understand something and oh shit I mean look at the Lion King Simba is a whiny little shit for half that movie and then you start to like him yeah yeah whereas Pixar would have got you to like him in the first 10 minutes and then yeah. tipped him off the freaking cliff well I mean Up is the best example of that mm. yeah like I know of no other movie or I mean really any animated piece of cinema I've ever seen that got me to love a pair of characters that quickly and then be that brutal with it absolutely yeah. if you want to ruin someone's day you send them the first 10 minutes of up oh, it's rough like, it's really rough first thing in the morning 7 o'clock oh someone has sent me a message it's just up playing like you monster <laughs> well that day's <laughs> ruined <laughs> <laughs> well the day can only go up from there <laughs> Fucking goddamn! <laughs> um, I mean, I was going to save this for later, but it actually does really dovetail really nicely into a thing because I wanted to talk about uh, the new season of Love, Death, and Robots is out. Mm. Um, I don't really want to spoil too much of it because I absolutely adore Love, Death, and Robots, and it's probably a little too early for us to be like massively spoiling these short little yeah. things. But I do want to talk about it because. There's one episode of Love, Death, and Robots Season 3. I'm just really happy that... we got the three robots back. I know, right? Oh, that so one is good. Um, I'm just pulling up... Like, I would so happily can... watch more of those guys. Just their interactions with the world, essentially. Learning about humans. It's like This is great. I want more of these angry little robots doing things. Crap. Where is it? The episode title. Why is it not here? Ah, oh, god damn it. Um, there, there's one episode that's... Um, uh, I can never pronounce the name. Uh, it It's this episode that's... Uh, if you've seen the trailers, it's the one with the, the girl coming out of the lake. Um, oh, yeah, the last A one. lot of people have found it very odd of an episode. It's done by the same guy who did uh, The Witness from, I think it's season mm. one. Mm. Um, which is that weird time loop one. Um, I bring this up, yeah, season one, The Witness. Um, I bring this up because the the guy who made this short was really big on, I don't have to say anything, I can do everything with visuals. Mm. In the entire run of that episode, I barely understand what's going on. Same, I had no idea what was happening. I mean, I get the gist of it, but like none of it makes enough sense. Yeah. Like, she pops out of the lake, the deaf guy doesn't get brought in because he's deaf, he's deaf so he can't hear a siren wail, and then he murders her, and then gets punished by getting the ability to hear, and then she just kills him. It, it's fucking weird, and I don't get it. It was the weirdest um, one to end on, because normally they leave a, a really good one for last, and that, to me, felt like the weakest of the new batch. There I were, would agree. Honestly, I would have ended on the crab one. The crab one was fucking amazing. and Yeah, uh, Bad Traveling, episode yeah. two. Um, that is an amazing episode. Like, that one's fantastic. Um, the very pulse of the machine is probably their best visual episode. I think they um, had a few people from the first one come back. Because uh, the pulse of the machine reminds me of the the shark or the... Um, the swimming one from the first season where the, the guy is like yeah, in the desert. Yeah, it is. Around. It's the same company. Same company yeah. did that one. Uh, what is it? Uh, Fish Night, I think it is. Yeah, and the bear, um, that one is the same guy who did the Dracula one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
God. <laughs> kind of kill team kill. Call. Yeah, no, that's the that's the new one with the bear. Mm. Uh, uh, Sucker of Souls is that's is it. the one from season one. Um, yeah, it, it's it's excellent. I love that one. I think the MVP for this season is Swarm. Ooh, that episode that one's a good is. One. That one is amazing. Like, after I finished watching it, I was like, please tell me this one's based on a book. And it is, but the book stops at the same spot. So ah, there's no more. No. Ah, it's so good. Like, if you could watch only one episode, as much as I love the three robots, if you could watch one episode from season three, I'd tell you to watch Swarm. It is the best episode. I loved Swarm, but I actually really enjoyed the one that came after it, which is the one about the rats and the, the farmer trying to, <laughs> to get rid of them. That, to me, was great, because I loved it, um, but it also allows us to like go into another topic, which is murder hamsters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. This is... I. I how have we... Not, have we not made enough movies about how this is a dumb idea? Not yet, apparently. But we should definitely... Uh, Dan, tell us about the murder hamsters. Tell us about the murder hamsters. So, there's a university doing studies on trying to make uh, creatures more placid and how chemicals work in the in the brain to make them so. And so they found by editing a genome in hamsters, they could try to throttle the the, the aggressive tendencies in these little creatures the reason they used hamsters is because the chemical makeup of the brain is apparently very similar to humans so is the same reason they use mice for things yeah but the mice work differently uh, in the brain chemistry uh, the hamsters release for, uh, some of the same chemicals that humans don't anyway so through editing these genomes they've changed the a certain receptor in the brain to not receive these chemicals and instead of making them more placid they've made them hyper aggressive to <laughs> members of both sexes so the female hamsters became hyper aggressive to the males and other females same for the male hamsters and carnage ensued hmm. if this isn't a tale that has been told in many movies media Anywhere I mean, in sci-fi, I don't know what is. This is just stupid. The first one that comes to mind is uh, was it Twenty Eight Days, where it starts with a monkey biting a guy. In this case, it's going to be a hamster bite someone. Oh, yeah. You've got rage zombies running around, like without. You know, that's just going to happen. That's how we're all doomed now. But then like, there's this is the exact story of the Reavers from Firefly. Like literally the exact things. Like, well, we tried to make them placid, but some of them went hyper aggressive. Like, guys, stop it. Look, the 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 core idea of doing some some gene alteration isn't inherently bad. Hmm. There are like legitimate uses for such a setup, but come on, like we turned hamsters into murder balls. Really, that's you. That that's what you succeeded at. We made things more brutal. See, the fun what thing the is. Fuck? When uh, John Doe sent it to us in chat, it was the whole thing. Yeah, like I, I'm worried about what they're going to do with this pacifism. Like I'm more worried about what they're going to do with the angry shit now. Like, yeah, I don't trust the government not to use that for evil. I would use that for evil. I would happily dose a bunch of hamsters and release them upon the world. Just a swarm. See what happens. So uh, just randomly insert them into pet shops. Mm. A quote from the article. Uh, we were really surprised at the results. Uh, we anticipated that if we eliminated the vasopressin activity, we would, redu- we would reduce both aggression and so- social communication. But the opposite happened. This suggests a startling conclusion. Even though we know that vasopressin in- increases social behaviours by acting within a number of brain regions, it is possible that more global effects affect the brain <laughs> as they do. Uh, we don't understand this system as well as we thought we did. Like, so it turns out that chemical is just blocking the elder gods going, kill, kill, kill. And now the hamsters can hear it. So we have like tiny Cthulhu hamsters. Can you imagine a wave God, of yeah, hyper aggressive yeah. hamsters rolling over the hill? You're sitting in your bunkers going, this is the 10th day of the hamster war. Whatever <laughs> will we do? <laughs> can you imagine and- reading the history later, though? Like, you know, a couple hundred years down the line, it's like, what the fuck was the hamster war? Like, ah, ah. Well, it, it's you know not a bad conclusion of the early thing? 2020s. 
No, actually, yeah, no, that would be a good season finale, to be honest. It would be. And as they roll over the hill in the background, you just hear the hamster dance playing. It's like, oh, we're <laughs> going to die to the fucking hamster dance. God damn. Yes. So as I feel like be. this would like not go down super well in the in the United States, simply for one reason: a lot of ride on mowers. <laughs> that is a good point, actually. Oh well, no, it's like, the hamster wave. Get the mower, honey. By the same time, in Australia, we have cane toads, and you, you see every bloke running around with a golf club and lawn mowers, and those things mm. like are everywhere. They're making their way well into New South Wales. So, And they sit there for a while. They will let you club them with a stick. Unlike a hamster, which will be running around every five, like, every which well, way. But see, like the, the key difference in this discussion is, yes, cane toads are a good analogous thing to a hamster wave, but... Toads will let you sit there and hit them with a golf club. Mm. Also, true. Uh, toads are actually surprisingly difficult to kill at times. Yes, though no, they are weirdly durable. Though there's Australian birds, uh, awesome. crows and hawks that have found ways to kill them. They don't particularly want to eat them. They land on top of them, so they sit still, then flip them over, peck a small hole in their stomach, and the cane toad's first defense is to puff up. As they do, they <laughs> just squit their own innards all over the place and the bird just flies away Didn't yeah I can that. see crows or magpies doing that they like, they're vicious they're little buggers little but the god damn they're clever oh, yeah. but if you make yeah, friends with them friends for life like I can still wander around where I used to have a house and the magpies they remember me it's been like a few generations since it's like ah the legends tell of this one we don't attack that one like, <laughs> it was great we used to feed them scraps and then go wandering in the park and you'd see everyone else getting swooped like just random families all just having a nice day out and then there's a bunch of us you know bastards in the corner like yeah no one attacks us <laughs> all for the cost of a, lo- a loaf of bread each month it was great during COVID you sacrificed uh, this loaf of bread <laughs> <laughs> during the, all the lockdowns uh, I was working in the winery and I came home one day and uh, across the road from our place is a, a big oval and uh, in the grass where they hadn't mowed was uh, a peewee chick and uh, oh, yeah. so I walked over and I looked around and the, the mother was in the tree above it squawking it was falling out of a nest it still had all its feathers but it couldn't quite fly yet hmm. so I, I picked it up and took it home we kept it in the shoebox and uh, went to the pet shop and bought uh, mealworms for it so we fed it hmm. and just looked hmm. after it watered it everything till it could fly and it still comes back. Now there's a mob of about six of them that land out in our back porch <laughs> and you can hand feed them mealworms and every like last year there was four of them the year before there was only two of them now there's four of them and yeah now there's six of them sitting out there that chip every friggin day so they remember (laughs) they're clever little buggers yeah yeah yeah. well I mean like a lot of birds are very clever and then they're sometimes very cleverly stupid I think we all remember that uh, article about the kookaburra that ate so many snags it could no longer fly (laughs) yeah yes is that stupid or is that just who can pass up a snag really come on (laughs) snag and bread with a bit of onion you'd you'd get me in a trap with that yeah it's like the possum who broke into a bakery and they found him like a box of like donuts I regret nothing (laughs) you can kill me but I I have one because it's like reclined back with the big (laughs) fat belly and just smeared jam (laughs) so good you can just tell us like you can kill me but I have won this fight let's be honest but, like, speaking of, like, getting me in traps with sausages, I'm not going to lie, that's half of why I went and voted in this election. That is mm. the trap. True. They get you in with the sausage. Yeah. While you're here, throw a vote down. Eh. Oh, man, I swear they got... Vi- the, the volunteers were getting pushy this year. It was fun. Oh, yeah. We had a, a punch-up at one of our schools from the, the volunteers that turned up. We had a, a liberal bloke turn up and a labor bloke turn up and both of them drank at the same pub on the same day and neither of them agreed Ooh. on policy and they were into it god damn it was I that went to vote just for that <laughs> oh, this is, you know, snag so you get dinner and a show it's pretty fun absolutely it makes it all worthwhile democracy yeah. at work <laughs> and now you know who to yell shit at the local pub just to see what they do <laughs> but, oh god okay but that's so, done for four years yes i'm very happy until local that. elections so, yay yay <laughs> they're not as bad though um no they also right, don't have sausages so i'm mm. i know right no democracy dogs mm. 
got to rely on Bunnings. How are you supposed to get me to vote if you're not going to give me my snag? You need a treat. You Um, need a reward for it. You go through to hell. You need a reward. Yeah. Then, then Look, that's I, a weird thing though because you put that logic towards Bunnings having them every uh, every weekend as well. It's like, but now I actually like going to Bunnings. What is this? <laughs> now I get a reward. Pretty sure it's why and Bunnings reward. did it. Yeah, <laughs> double the reward. Right now to change gears a little bit, and I swear to God this is going to be the last time I bitch about this show because well the season's over. Mm. Um, it is like I want to talk to Swoosh about some stuff to do with the last episode of Halo. Which I have not watched. And it. I'm going to tell you the episode's kind of trash and and the ending of the seasons is really not worth it. But I very specifically wanted to show Swoosh a couple of scenes of the <clears throat> last episode from his animation perspective because he did spend an awful lot of money to get that accreditation. I did. I might as well use it occasionally. So um, I'm going to start by just setting a baseline. Like, this is how the CG can look in this show. Mm. Um, So, for anyone who wants to follow along, this is in episode one, about 11 minutes 47 in, when the Covenant attack. So, there's plenty of shots in in this section of, you know, I mean, they even do a first person sequence. The only part I hated about this sequence was when he throws the gun, it looks like an actual game prop. But the thing I want you to focus more on is the Sengeli. They look pretty good. The, The... generally got a good size to them they've generally kind of moved with a bit of weight they're they're not bad like i mean it's digital in live action it's never going to look amazing yeah but they don't look that bad so that is from episode one and i just wanted to show that to you just to get a baseline going so that when i show you the rest of this you understand the fucking train wreck i mean throughout most of them the cg has been pretty okay for the uh some girl they they... okay so Oh, oh, yo, you fucking wait, buddy. Oh, no. This is a scene from later where a Spartan is trying to catch up to a spaceship that's escaping. Mm. So I just wanted to show you this because the character really, like, can you see the lack of weight? Yeah. They're, but they're they no did longer. That previously, actually, when they had them running along behind a Jeep, there was the same kind of weightless feeling to them. I think the thing that helped is that the jeep was at least moving. Yeah, you had a, a reference. Whereas in this scene, it's it's Kai chasing after Halsey's ship, hmm. and there's no frame of reference. She outruns everything, so it tends to get this kind of like weird, weightless, bouncy moonwalk thing going. Yeah. It's very odd. Even that you know, scene, they um, jumped through the roof and landed in there. They bounced three or four times to make it look like, oh my god, there's a bit of weight here, but you've done, yeah. you've overdone there's it. There's none. Yeah. Like, yes. Oh, I, no, I, don't, I don't even I don't, want to watch you, this show anymore. It's not Halo. Look, no. Were, it, it, were we correct? Did they did they cuck us on the fucking Halo at the end? Oh, they absolutely did. They don't. Yes! They don't. Call they're it. not oh, even. On, it. They're not even on the way to Halo yeah, by a, the end what? of this show. A season three ender. Um, Fuck! I, are you kidding me? They're not even, not even on the way to the Halo yet. No, they 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 have half a map. Uh, Fuck off, so it will be a season three thing. It will be, yeah. Um, okay, so this is that. Okay, so in this season, the last episode is on the Covenant homeworld. They, hmm. They're not on high charity in this this thing. They have this desert scene that they're part of. Um, look at this fucking shit. Yeah. Like, how fucking empty and dead is this? Like, that right there is a battlefield no one's 2042. Crying. Yeah. But, like, you can tell no, that they're enough. just. They're just on a sand pit, mm. and there's not like he didn't even step on anything in that shot. They just add it in. It looks really dumb. But where's this? Like just up there's this big sweeping shot right here. That is empty and boring. What this, is that? This is them trying to show off the grand high temple of the prophets. This is what they made it look like. <laughs> I've seen PS2 games with better shit than this. That looks like that old Quake map How is where you're this? Uh, well above Earth and there's like the two temples and there's the two paths yeah. with a jetpack yeah. in the middle. That's all that looks like. Yeah. Like a basic multiplayer what? map with no filler. I know what this they is... tried to do. They tried to actually make it seem like a multiplayer map from Halo, but even the Halo maps in the first one had more po- like prop density than this stuff. They have life to yeah. them. This doesn't. Yeah, this is... 
boring and dead, and I don't like it. This doesn't look like anyone even did a lighting pass on it to make it look good. Yeah. Like, they've got braziers, but they only light the two pillars directly behind them. Not the ground, not the pillars around them, nothing. Like, who? I'm not even an animator, and I'm looking at this being like, what the fuck? I did, this- a, I did a... How this an intro to animation. God damn it. No, no, if you look at the uh, the braziers there, because for anyone playing at home, the braziers are lit, but they have a very solid shadow cast by them, which means that they didn't have these as lit braziers during filming. They were just... The thing was there. No, so, this is a whole CG set. This isn't yeah. filmed. Oh, that's even so worse. This means a digital artist put it in but didn't light map the braziers so that, like, they're clearly on fire. Anyone who wants to look at it, go to the last episode, go to 29 minutes, 23, and you can see it. And it's it's dumb. Like, <clears throat> this isn't a set where there's people running around. This is a CG fill-in shot. Yeah, like, this should not have been a, a major thing. This if, looks like If you look done. at where the this pillars like... touch the sand, they're, like, literally cookie-cutter just sat on yeah. top. There's no sand. See... As it plays, you can see some sand like a little over the edges and all over the place. Yeah. But that opening mm. scene where it's like, oh my god, here's the setting, it's sat there. Like there's no it doesn't yeah. interact. Well it's, because clearly the actors are in this? like a sand pit. But how like the as the sh- I know. And as it goes on, like more CG characters start showing up, so they can't devote as many frames to the animation. So it starts getting jerky or the characters start looking worse like these brutes have shown up like I've continued showing them a little more Um, and these brutes have shown up before and they look better like they look really trash now the first person sequence from the first episode looks better than this big fight scene that they're really trying to pay off as this Mm. amazing sequence the doom first person scene looks better than this yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we are also question. going um, through, like, uh, you look at them and they did that thing where it's like, oh, you know, this this guy was a big, scary one at the start. And it's like, yes, we fought one brute and the chief got his ass handed to him. And now mm. he's comfortably taking on four of them. And he's not yeah. gone through any training. He's not gone through anything apart from taking that fucking inhibitor shit. Not even him. a I'm better now montage. Yeah. Oh, he gets better at this point, but it's a plot thing, so I won't. Oh, more plot armor. Too much. Um, oh no, it, it absolutely is plot armor. He's supposed to be dead. Um, but like, this Singeli suddenly start looking like trash. Like, mm. this dude, in this episode, now looks less detailed because they've got to add in all this extra animation they want to do. Yeah. Even it is the really, technical artist really with the dust stupid. there is hor- horrible. Yeah. This I mean, reminds me the- of um, the ending of Boba Fett, where they like, oh, we put a lot of money into the, uh, the Rancor, but what else? It's like, well. Apparently not the aim for the bots who are not shooting at the grouped people. Mm. They took their aiming from, I mean, early, like, from early stormtroopers. Mm, sure. I mean, That's all they were modeling. Look at this shot. In this this one here. The sun is... The, there's a sun behind it, which should cast shadows, but mm. it doesn't. Everything in front is in full light. All the statues are... But the light, shadows on the statues aren't even going in the same direction. Yeah, actually... Like, Someone's massively fucked up the light box there because the light source should be behind really the tower. You can see it there, but there's Ooh. no shadow from it. I know! That's so weird. I, it's all coming from, like, the left. But it's not because some of it is, but if you look at the statue on the right-hand side, yeah. the light source is above it. Yeah, no, fuck, you're right. This is 90s this is multiplayer. This shadow is down across its chest. This is everything is I hope someone got fired. Someone put ambient lighting on this for some reason. I, I watched this, and the first thing I thought was, oh, I have to talk to Swish about this on the podcast, because it's so bad. And I'm not, I did, like, I did, uh, like, everyone at the university we did had to do the intro to programming, animation, and web design. Hmm. So I've only done intro to animation. I'm looking at this going, you're fucked up. <laughs> yeah. I hope someone was fired for this. This is just bad. For a a final episode as well because I don't think yeah. they're getting more I really don't I think they've been I'm pretty sure they've already been cleared for season 2 oh god um, when you can make a series like, like that, this is- and not even look at the source material of course they're not going to look at the actual like technical of making the show shit no that makes sense actually it's why I learn mean- to make a show when we just make the show we'll learn on the go I think I know why this scene probably has just generally global <clears throat> illumination. 
It's so you can see all the detail on the pelican. Uh, yeah, probably. Because it's flying away. But its jet boosters, which are clearly glowing, are giving off no ambient light. Wow. They went for a, <laughs> I'm sorry, a 2K, the more 4K I look 4K at it, render it, the more it annoys the pelican, me. But they're still using like 720p textures on everything else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at this. Look at this sweeping shot. Like, it's just coming down on all these Singali that look terrible. Is it meant to be a floating it, island? It's, 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 a, it's a mesa. That you can't no, see any island. other world um, anywhere in the background. Oh, like, its planet is completely isolated. Um, here's the drop shot where they go down. Um, so this is their planet, and they're oh, the only thing on it. finally puts the helmet back on. Yeah. And they're just dropping down to a mesa. It's not an isolated floating piece of land. Of course he put the helmet That's on. the There's tower no in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's going to save his poon tank. Hey, if it's I not on, it's understand. not on. Yeah. I still don't understand how... Like, why they had the uh, the renegade chick. The, uh, what are they? Rebellion Kai. chick running around. Kai. Oh, no, no, not Kai. The, the actual rebellion chick from the uh, first planet they were on. Yeah. I don't know. She doesn't feature in the last two episodes. She's not even going with them to Halo. Yeah, like, her story is still open, which shouldn't have been there. We don't need a, you know, stand-in for the audience in this kind of thing. That's what Chief and the Spartans were. But, ah, why? There was such good source material to play with. If they had just done the Spartan training, I would have watched the shit out of this show. Yeah. Just Spartan training Holy for different Spartans and followed their story. Mm. Oh, been great. So many missed opportunities in this whole friggin' thing. Hell, in the, the book series, there is actually a part where um, the next batch of Spartans after Chiefs are midway through doing stuff when their planet gets glassed. So the training planet gets completely fucked up by the Covenant. And that's where most of the other Spartans die as well. But why not just have, if not going to do anything canon, have them escape. Just get a bunch of Spartans who steal the younger generation of Spartans. Like, alright, cool, we're going to train you now. Or why does it even have to be the the Master Chief generation, like, as you've seen in the the newer games? There are newer versions Mm. of Spartans. Why not Mm. follow a a squad of soldiers that are going through and they're selected for the Spartan program, so the first season is them becoming Spartans, the latest generation Mm. of Spartans. Yep. They had so many other opportunities. Hell, hell jumpers in general. They were a Absolutely. fun idea. The Start guy off with a squad of hell forward. jumpers. Yeah, yeah, the ODSTs are badass. Absolutely. Like, they are terrifying. It's like, what do you do? Oh, we drop from orbit onto things and shoot crap out of it. Like, right, what, have you been augmented? No, we're just base human. How good would it have been yeah. the first episode? Like, it just opens up with a hell jumper canopy, just straight down, screaming, <clears throat> big crash, and there's massive battle. And they're just running yeah, head yeah. first into it. Start with a massive that epic scene, and you've got three quarters of the audience hooked in the first thirty seconds, and that's it. it you follow yes. that squad through the battle, and then they're selected to become Spartans. Instead, we had a bunch of teenagers taking drugs. Because <laughs> that's how Halo uh, started: a bunch of teenagers taking drugs. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely and, was. And then getting murdered by the Covenant. It was just all right. It was like, and then um, later on, she does more drugs to find out about her dad. And she, her um, arc is nothing but taking drugs. That's exactly. all it is. Like she, she took drugs, and maybe it's all just one really bad trip, like for this, <laughs> this chick, because she takes drugs and suddenly aliens and you know Spartans. Oh God, why? And, so really, Chief isn't there. It's just her bad trip. Yeah, and her story arc is just her re-upping. It's just like oh. <laughs> That's what this whole show is. It's like someone's got an idea of, oh, this is Halo, and now they're on a bad trip for the entire thing, and that's what this show is. Episode one of season two is going to be waking up, oh my god, now we've got to come down, and the rest of the next season is going to be them coming down, Mm. and that's it. Well, I mean, there is an entire sequence in the last episode where to get to the Covenant homeworld, they they have to go through this, they figure out where it is, because it's... They, they look at a system and go, there's no planet there. And then Chief's like, scan it again. And Cortana, of course, goes, oh, there's actually a weird gravitational anomaly happening in this area that if you, like, pass it out, it's probably bending a lot of light so you can't actually see into the nebula. And 
they refer to it as a, uh, I think it's a stained glass or a kaleidoscope. Mm. So when they're flying through it, it's just like fucking colours, man! See, that's where the budget went for all the CGs. Like, ah, uh, colours. Just all of them. We're freaking so out, man. There's speed. planets in the trees and they're just everywhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> So they basically just went ludicrous speed, didn't they? So like, we have to get this planet ludicrous speed. Oh, kinda. They they go in and like the this is like Katana's on their little console because they're like they can't see the gravitational anomalies. So mm. Corner Hunter's like, I'll tell you how to get past all the gravitational anomalies so we can get to the other side. Mm. Halfway through doing that, mm. she cuts out and can't talk to him because the console's fucked up. Huh? Do either of you see the problem here? <sighs> A little bit. Yeah. I, uh, so, how are they not a smear on the side of some gravitational anomaly? No, no. Cortana is surgically implanted in this series. Oh, how right. How does she stop uh, talking to him? She's part of his head. She should be the voice yeah. in the back of his head no matter what. She yeah. can't disappear. I forgot they, they made her surgical, this one. The, there is a reason for that. I can tell you what it is. All right. The idea is that Halsey didn't want John. She wanted what he could be mm. and by surgically implanting Cortana she can fully take him over yeah that's the yeah. whole point that's why she had to be surgically implanted she couldn't be a chip because she is supposed to wholly and completely take him over the weird thing is Holy just seems cartoonishly evil in this series like and she was cartoonishly evil in the books let's be honest she kidnaps a bunch of kids and leaves behind flawed clones so they die and no one absolutely. questions absolutely but the, the Spartans but just, in the like, games oh, and the books up. are more okay. compelling. Like, they're people yeah. that have a reason to fight. Like, there's a reason to go yeah. through all of this shit. And they were never actually built to fight the Covenant, which is no, they were, funnier. Like, they were meant to be like... They were built to put down prior uprising. Just for normal people. They I mean, wanted beings that could just... Oh, we're going to walk in and now this building is gone. For yeah. a standard friggin' rebellion. Like... I, and even some of the side stuff in the original books, like at one point, no, the graduation for the Spartans, once half of them had been weirded out by either dying because they're weak or dying because surgery fucked up, um, they're dropped in the middle of the wilderness with nothing. You're basically bare ass naked. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, you have to get back. You have to go and take over this, this waypoint. Good luck. And off they went. And cuts to like three days later, and they're in like the bunker behind glass like observing this just basically a little flag in the middle of a concrete room full of machine gun pods and god knows what else it's like oh how much reckon, how long do you reckon there'll be it's like, oh we've got another couple of days at the very least we can finish all preparations and then of course they kick in the fucking ceiling rappel down in full fatigues every, in you know, tactical gear it's like where the fuck did they get that it's like I don't know and then they check later on turns out they ran across the supply line and just raided it yeah. it's like they naked like butt naked out of the wilderness the Spartans took down the supply line took all their shit and ran <laughs> I would love to have seen that in a in a show it'd be yeah, great that would have been amazing it would have been a hilarious end to a first season it would have made yeah, them an actual that character people wanted to watch but that's source right, material yeah. and we don't need that I am actually really annoyed that I was correct in my prediction that they would not like step foot on Halo. I I told you that'll be a season three thing at the earliest. Mm. Season two will be finding the rest of the map, and then there might be a grainy image in the last episode of season two. Season three will be the travel two. You still won't be on it at the end of season three. It'll be as a an image in the background, and that's all you'll get of it. That yeah. And then that's what if they're banking on a season four. Shit canned, they're banking yeah, on a if, season if, four for that. They definitely are. If this series gets shit canned by the next one, we will never see a Halo in the Halo series. No. We will be as no. the show Apart floats up to heaven. That's a bad yeah. <laughs> He's had It's a not going to heaven, let's be honest. <laughs> He's had a couple of psychic projections to the Halo ring, but that's mm. it. That's, that's the sum total. And the show implies that that may not even be real. We have seen more Halo rings in Moonfall than we have seen in the Halo series. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. in Moonfall, the moon's fucking full of them! How did, no, how did this it. get three seasons and Firefly got one? I know, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah no, there is no, no justice in oh, the world. Oh, there isn't. There really isn't. Like, scrap this and do another four seasons of Firefly for the same budget. 
if we did Firefly again, I would I would want two of the original cast back, uh, only to act as mentors for a new generation of the, the sh- like the crew. You bring yeah. back Mal and Jane. They're the only two you need. And it's just like, right, yeah. cool. And what do you do? Like, well, I'm retiring and giving you this, so you give me a cut of your income. If and they redid James it and did not have hamsters sitting on the shoulders of Reavers, I would be sorely disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> the Reaver that wins, like, the Reaver that commands everyone else is just a one tiny hamster. Yeah. Little skull spear. Or it, is it actually the hamster? It's like a, it's like from Total Recall. They, the Reaver walks up and opens the shirt and there's a hamster growing out of the side and that's secretly the boss. <laughs> <laughs> he goes back inside to his hamster wheel and that's what makes the bloke move. <laughs> Did you He's know the, the writer for that movie... Uh, the writer from the movie finally gave away the ending. He, he finally whether said what it was meant to be. Wh- whether he was being lobotomized or if it was real. Interesting. So, spoiler for anyone who hasn't seen it, he's being lobotomized. That's what the fade to white is. Ooh. So, the entire thing is, when he has the, the agent come in trying to convince him to get out, it is real. He is trying to get him out of the simulation. Um, and by shooting him, it just sticks him in there forever so they lobotomize him like yeah that's pretty cool I never knew that good yeah. to know that's more well, useless trivia I can now spread around thank you very much so I just loved it you're welcome I am full of useless trivia it's great I feel like all three of us are yeah yeah there's plenty I mean, of a- unnecessary <laughs> knowledge oh yeah if nothing else I will be happy if this podcast forces more people to watch Soldier and that's about it I'm done <laughs> I can force Poppy to watch that movie, I'm good. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I think the thing we're all going to be talking about next week is going to be Obi-Wan. Yes, yes. that comes out very soon. Because that comes out either Friday afternoon our time or Saturday. I, like, Probably Saturday. America time's a bit... <clears throat> actually, Disney's really good about actually releasing our time. It's usually about 6 p.m., um, but it's still America, and I usually base everything America time on whatever the next day is. Yeah. I'm yeah, kind of um, hoping Disney is good about it. Plus one, yeah. pretty much. I'm kind of hoping that the first episode is literally like because everyone's bitching about him using a, a blaster for some reason. I just want to see him light up the lightsaber and go, "Oh, I should not have done this." Ah, uh, and that's what prompts the Inquisitor to no, come no. down. The first episode needs to be him taking his lightsaber and putting it in a fucking box. Yes, just away so it can't be touched. That no, even better. He does that and then sits down, and starts reading like you know a newspaper or something just to. He's on his way. And just diving out of a window. Then you see Darth Maul knocking the door. Hello? Is, can Obi-Wan come out to play? <laughs> or him just... Are they, him turning uh, up to, uh, they, like, the, the family's place and just throwing the kid through the door. Look after that. Hot <laughs> 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 <Just pop> potato! <laughs> <laughs> Although, the clap back from uh, Uncle Owen. It's like, he needs to be trained. Like, what? Like his dad? <laughs> Oh, well done, Uncle Owen. He'd be better off Got as a moisture farmer. On you. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. let him go get some power converters every now and again, and he'll be right. Don't worry about it. Oh yeah, it'll be fine. Look, man, I'm just happy that like like most of the Disney stuff's been really good, and particularly the Star Wars stuff. Big fan of Clone Wars. Bad Batch was great. Mm-hmm. Mandalorian's been really good. Boba was only maligned because for some reason this was really stealth 3.5 fucking uh, mm-hmm. Mando. Um, so I'm expecting good things. I'm I'm looking forward to next week not coming on this podcast and going. So the thing I've been watching fucking sucks. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm absolutely excited to come on and be like, it's really good. I want more people to watch it. Great. Although speaking of things that more people should watch, we're getting more lower. Uh, was it lower deck soon? Oh fuck yes! That's gonna be great. Oh my, God. Hey, John Doe, have you watched Lower Deck? No, I've been meaning to. It's on the list, Ooh. and it's oh. one of those things. It's like, oh, I need to watch that, and then I start playing a game, and it's like, oh yeah, I should watch that. About that, actually, <laughs> that's fair. That but game, that, sorry, that show has ruined me for the new Star Trek season, which is the um, Strange New Lands. Strange New Lands. The reason being, the Starfleet badge that they have is the original Starfleet badge. Which is well, yeah, what because... a character in Lower Decks is based on. Badgie is the original like Star Trek badge. So yeah. every time that <laughs> fucking se- uh, that title comes up, all I can hear is "Hi, I'm Badgie." I'm like, yeah. ah. <laughs> Look, uh. like that show is is excellent if you 
have never watched Star Trek because mm. it's just a really good, <clears throat> well comedy show. But if you happen to have watched a lot of Star Trek, I mean, I've watched Next Gen, um, Voyager, DS9, Enterprise. Uh, there's probably more I can't think. Of. I've watched a bunch of the movies. Yeah. Um, so I'm, 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 a, I'm a look, man. I actually really like that movie. Bug off. Um, so, so like, I'm a big fan of Star Trek, and this show is great because all it does is go, "You're a fan. I'm gonna make fun of your stuff," yeah. and it's great. Love it's good when they so do that much. and you can actually get a laugh out of it, not just, I'm mm. going to poke fun and you're going to sit there and cry because, well, fuck you and everything you love. It's not poking fun at the fans, it's poking fun at the show. Yeah. And I'm okay which with that. Which is cool. Which is, I, I like that, but I also we're getting more Orville in like a month <sighs> or two because uh, that's yes. been dropped. And it's like, I'm, I'm <laughs> super keen for that. I know I shouldn't be, but so far they have not let me down at all. I'm like, I don't want to get too hyped just in case this is the one that fails. But at the same time, I'm getting more Orville and I'm happy. Given that they've managed to have that show not only be like more comedic, but still have some <clears throat> of that hard-hitting shit from Star Trek, it's mm. just like, holy crap. It's like, moral and, conundrum, but also jokes. Yeah, well, I mean, but like, they know when to not do the mor- the jokes. Mm. They can actually uh, stay like on the mild the, the hitting point without it. Yeah. Well, I think being the, degraded the best example of that comedy. is. Hmm? Yeah, hundred percent. I think the best example of that is actually toward the end of season two, where they have all of the the robots uprise. Yeah. And they don't play it for jokes. They play it straight. Like it's important. Like this is dangerous, and we need to deal with it. It's not oh hey, low and low funny robots. Yeah, you could always tell in that one when things was getting serious because they would not be making jokes. They'd actually switch mm. to, no, no, we're, we're an actual captain. We're going to do the thing now. Yeah. Uh, and then they do the thing. But, but I just like the fact they had Kermit the Frog there as a desk toy for so long and no one questioned it until like halfway through the second season. It's like, what? what is that? Ah, that's Kermit the Frog, a great leader from Earth. Like, that's all we needed. I like this. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, they, they know how to do, uh, like, even then they know how to use comedy mm. for a serious scene. Uh, when the security girl leaves and she leaves him a jar of pickles. Mm. It's yeah. from the first season. It's a joke reference. But now it's being used as a goodbye gift. It's actually using a joke in a clever way. It's so... I can't believe this shit comes from Seth MacFarlane. Yeah. Well, he does. It's like, like when it's not South. Oh, when it's not um, Family Guy, he actually does do some interesting stuff. Because I really well, enjoyed uh, Was a Million Ways to Die in the West. That was a really fun movie. Yeah, uh, like he can do good stuff, but it's hard to to remember that hmm. because most people think him as that he's the Family Guy guy. He's the American Dad guy. He does these dumb shows that are all just like throw jokes at wall. Yeah. But he can actually do a really good show and apparently he's like a massive Star Trek nerd so yeah. that's part of why this has been like a love project for him I just like the and fact that the characters act like real people yeah they do they absolutely like, do the well, same one where slightly exaggerated the, but yeah well, they've got the, the chick who lives in the hyper you know gravity world and mm. the pilot runs out like I've always wanted to do this just throws a can out and watches it crinkle mm. it's like ah he just runs back like I would do that I yeah. would happily do that if I was in that kind of situation. <laughs> like he'd come back with uh, a pile of flattened things and just throwing more shit out. Yep. Yep. Out of ten. It's really good. Like, that is an amazing show. Um, you know, more, sh- more, more shit for John Doe to watch. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've watched the first <laughs> season of Orville. I don't think I've seen the second yet, though. It's one of those things the that tend to pretty fall fun. by the wayside. <laughs> That's fair. That is very fair. I'm, I'm not going to criticize you for not watching everything. Not even I watch everything, and I watch a lot of stuff. Yeah, I play far I too many games to watch everything. I need to yeah. manage my time a little better. Dude, preaching to the fucking choir. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think work hours are going to have to get cut back. I still need to play. I still. Need... <laughs> They're interfering with like everything. Yeah, work or sleep. The full work. Or... Yeah, we just do adopt the four-day work week so we can all get some gaming in. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I agree wholeheartedly. I'm, I'm all for that. If you're in the next Actually, election, someone sent vote. Me... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, someone sent me a thing recently, which I have to fact-check it, but it was apparently... Um, it was a, We work more than medieval peasants did because even the guys back then realized we have to let them have a day off every so often so they don't fucking revolt. I'm like, I need to fact-check this, but that sounds about right. Uh, there's something in my brain that feels like that's correct. 
because it's like the was it 30 hour work week and then rising up all came from the industrial revolution when we could actually work during the night so, or when it was cold or yeah. raining or anything like that uh, yeah so fun times yeah <laughs> Uh, um, I, I, you read Monster Hunter, didn't you? Yes, I did. Well, listened to, read, however you want to define audible. But consumed. Yes, I consumed the content, and I <laughs> extremely thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd, I'd highly recommend it for almost anyone to listen to. I normally listen to yeah. like sci-fi military shit, and this was a very, very welcome change. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is I a think great one. Yes, I think it that'll really help people. Like probably like you who like that sort of thing is it. It's not entirely out of the military thing because they, they they run like a PMC. Yeah, very much so. Um, and yeah, the guy who writes it as well is a massive gun nut. So oh yeah, he is. Uh, he really proponents the the idea that Cookie Monster is a secret operator. <laughs> yeah, I, I just love the fact that um, like was it anytime you guys have one of the rants about guns, like it has these things and these things, and it's like. I have no idea what's going on, but at the very end of it, he has a little tagline. It's like, for those who don't know about guns, this is a really, really good gun. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, have, yeah. Like, I like this. Now I know what to think. It was the um, the shotgun that he has. Yeah. The, the abomination. abomination. So, what's like, <laughs> how many laws does this break? Oh, all of them. Yeah. I set out to do it. <laughs> I, but the thing that's crazy is, like, you already read the first book, and... Yep. Like, like talking around actual spoilers. The whole, the the kind of crux of the novel is like an apocalypse. Yeah. In book one, and, and not just like uh, end of the world. It's time will no longer exist. So it's end of universe. It's the the old ones coming yeah. back, and that is reality now. Deal with it. Yeah. And it's terrifying. Oh, it's just well written it leaves enough for you to question all the way through it going oh shit is this what's going to happen or how are they going to get around this and you mm. you get thrown into enough deep ends you can fuck how the what is going to happen next or how is this going to pan out yeah, yeah. it is well but worth that it. is the first book which means that you've at least encountered the elves yes yes I have the elves are so good the, the elves are the best <laughs> defining the, those elves is odd because there's there's a character in the book I love which, when they're driving there to explain it to him and it's like oh because one guy likes Tolkien yeah and, and he, like, he, oh, he's like oh my god there's elves there's these mm. mystical lovely beings that like for, for all this evil in the world there also has to be some secret good and oh my god we're gonna go meet elves and then he meets elves yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that is I literally love, the like, best the, way to the put way it. you said that is Perfect. It is the exact <laughs> tone for discovering those elves oh, in that book. Oh my like, God. I don't even want to say what they are because it's it's We so need more good. people to read this series. I want that series adapted properly. Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. That would be it's, great. It's fantastic. But it's like that genre actually, modern fantasy, I quite enjoy because there's uh, Monster Hunter International, uh, mm -hmm. Dresden Files, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Where you can have the uh, fantasy aspects of it, but in a modern society. So it's things like, oh, what, what happened to vampires when people started bringing in semi-automatic weapons? They got fucked. Oh, well, that's what dude, happened. In the, in the my final favorite fight bit, scene like, of no that, content. there's, there's yeah. a, a vampire in that that's saying to the old ones, like, don't go out there. You haven't fought a human in a long friggin' time. It, things have changed. Like, no, no, things haven't changed. We are still the old ones. We're going to go there and kick ass. And then they walk into oh, the artillery fire. Right. It's like, you yeah. dumb fuck. <laughs> the ancient vampires things have been changed. The they walk into a wall of lead and Just silver and then RPG machine fire. Machine guns and explosives. Oh. <laughs> okay. It's like, this is what happens when you step out of society for a few hundred years. Shit changes. <laughs> Oh, mm. we'll be but fine we've seen your, their your cannons the you haven't seen what became of those cannons mm. yeah I'm keen to see what you think of the next one because it dovetails off the current one and what happened at the end yep and yeah it, it's pretty fun the, uh, the essentially they, they more or less throw the main character under the bus to the old ones I love it well, the uh, the epilogue of the first one is um, mm. they they asked, like, why didn't, when this all kicked off, why didn't you just nuke the whole thing? And they go, we tried. And then the epilogue is them 
trying and what happened and how it all gets thrown back on the main character and yeah oh it That's just sets basically the what whole thing up the to next book. you're all fucked <laughs> yeah you punched an all basically they punched an all on the face enough to make it hurt and all he got was one name for it it's the name of the main character yeah so it's like well I'm gonna fuck that thing up it's like whoa uh, it's, it's they're wonderfully written they're so fun um, yeah like absolutely keep diving on those although swoosh uh, speaking of urban fantasy books I think there's one you've never read called Ghosts and Magic it sounds by, weird but I have not by read by M.R. Forbes I think you'd really like it hmm. it's got a bit of a Dresden Files vibe except the whole gist is the main character is a necromancer nice um, and in this setting necromancers are like fucking illegal you're not supposed to make necromancers because in this setting if for you to be a necromancer you have to be dying huh so the main oh, character I remember you I, mentioned this one a while ago yeah mm. when I read it because like it really gave me these Dresden file vibes because he does a lot of like the same kind of like investigative stuff Dresden does hmm. but because like I think he's got cancer if I recall it's been a while since I read the book um there's actually four of them uh, and, and so he's progressively dying and getting weaker but as he gets weaker he becomes a more powerful necromancer as he gets closer to death hmm. and nice. like all the other factions in the setting are like wait fuck what did you send a necromancer what the fuck man we're not <clears throat> supposed to have those who did this I always liked yeah. um, there was like, one book specifically in Dresden Files dealt with necromancers and what they do I really mm. liked their version of necromancy where you have to simulate the heartbeat yeah. So the idea for that one was you could bring the dead back, but you have to have a drum or something there to keep pounding out a rhythm to make sure that it, in place of a heart, it keeps going. And it's like, I like that. That's great. Because uh, it just brought in some weird shit. I love the fact, like, all the other ones have really simple and make sense things. You know, like the dude who's just, like, drumming the book against the side of his leg the whole time. Mm. And then, you know, in the heat of the moment, Dresden's, man, Dresden's like, one man band! Yeah. <laughs> Like, proper one man bet. I love Butters. He's one of my favorite characters in that series. Oh, Butters is great. But the that fact one, that he's. He's now a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so good, so good, so good, so good. There are some amazingly oh. like, crafted scenes in those books. Because the way that his writing seems to work is whilst the books themselves are really fun to read through, they are all crafting to one or two specific scenes in a book. Like. Yes. Uh, there's one of them where they go on a heist in Hades' vault just to go and, you know, because you do. Uh, one of his friends, a knight of the cross, who has a, had a sword with the one of the nails of the cross in it, that's where he got his power from. Uh, he's retired because he basically got crippled. But they're having a bit of a standoff between a fallen angel who's just across a wooden fence from him and him. It's just like, what are you going to do? Walk out here and hit me? Which point, an archangel who's just like looking after him, says, touches the shoulder, is like, go for it. It's like, what? I gave him my grace. He can walk again. And you just see him testing his leg out, like, <laughs> get me my fucking sword. <laughs> He's like, yes! But, yeah, uh, yeah. Michael, he was a, he um, was a great character. A friend of mine did, wanna, did want me to point out to you, John Doe, that there is a side series to Monster Hunter. Uh, you may... I think they refer, reference him in the first book. I can't remember. A character called Chad? Yep. Yeah, there's actually a set of books about Chad. Oh, nice. I'll have to go track those down as well. Um, because they're they're pre the, the actual Monster Hunter series, because the Monster Hunter series refers to the Christmas party incident. Yeah, yeah. Um, his books are set before that leading up to the Christmas party. Oh, awesome. Party. I, I do um, like the um, the wall they had, like the remembering wall. Yeah. And like, mm. when he's going through, he notices so many of them have the same date. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, what happened there? Uh, the Christmas party. <clears throat> but and that leads up to that's got to be a hell of a Christmas party. And you think, no, that's a wall of remembrance. Oh, oh, that was a hell of a Christmas party. Yeah. And then you hear what happened <clears throat> is like, oh yeah. <laughs> But like some of the side characters in those novels, like Agent Franks, um, mm. who is the the fuckwit, uh, the thing he was dating before in the first Grant. Book? Uh, Grant. Grant. Yeah, 
Fuck that guy. And, and even he yeah. racks off to Hollywood <laughs> to be a, mm. a consultant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that was a... That was a hard... Like, one of those characters in the book is like, I hope you die. And then they, you know, they don't die. It was like, why? Just fall over mm. dead now. Aneurysm. Just do the thing. Ugh. Um... What, well, I, I I feel like we're going to end up having a regular book club on this fucking show. I'd be good um, with that. Just, just one other one for you, for you, John Doe, if you haven't looked into it. If you looked any into any of the um, Blue Wolf books. Blue Wolf? No. No, I've, I've mainly so been the, military I, sci-fi. I haven't done a whole <clears throat> lot of fantasy. No, no, this is a military sci-fi book. Really? No, then no, I haven't. The idea is uh, some uh, uh, group goes out into the middle of buttfuck nowhere and, like, I can't remember if it is that, but, you know, like, sort of, like, Afghanistan-type area. Um, and they meet some natives and some shit goes down and the main character gets the Curse of the Blue Wolf, which essentially turns him into a giant blue werewolf. Huh. And he's got full military training, so a PMC group, I can't remember who they are off the top of my head, um, basically hires him with the idea that we'll figure out how to cure you from the blue wolf, but you need to do ops for us. And they team him up with a bunch of other supernatural characters and they go to like military operations as, as supernatural creatures. That's pretty cool. It, and the first book is called Blue Curse. Unicorn, isn't it? That's it by Brad Magnanella. Correct. Is yeah. this Task Force Unicorn? Kinda. Uh, I still have a credit. So uh, that one is now purchased alright I'll listen to that one during oh, look, the week you you like military fiction and <clears throat> you seem to be getting a little into this sort of like kind of magic sci-fi thing on the side it's like well that's that whole series of books jam excellent is, is doing well, that one thing <laughs> have we forced John Doe into reading The Forever War yet? I've already read I've uh, listened to The Forever War already yeah oh, it's a good yeah, one I've, it is oh. Yeah, that, my favorite that was my use pre-audible. of travel and time. I I acquired <sighs> copies of those from elsewhere before I learned of Audible and thoroughly yeah. enjoyed them. I think I browbeat every person I know with like, <laughs> read the Forever War, it's <laughs> Any, really fucking good. <laughs> Anytime someone's like, I need book recommendations, Forever War. Yeah. Just straight up, read the thing. It, like, it's it's amazing. I eventually convinced Dad to read it because uh, my old man never used to read much in the way of fantasy or sci-fi. He was always very much I'm a read technical thing, so he read like brief history of time and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But uh, when he retired, he's like, I have nothing to do. I'm like, well, here's some books. So I got him hooked on the Dresden Files and uh, all of Terry Pratchett. So he inhaled Terry Pratchett and loved mm. it. Uh, and then he moved on towards rereading everything done by uh, oh, who's the guy who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide? Um, uh, Douglas Adams. Uh, Douglas Adams. But did you know he wrote something along the lines of a hundred or so books? He no, has a it, huge catalogue. I'm not going to lie. I think the only Douglas Adams book I've ever read is Hitchhiker's. Yeah. I, I know there's five like, books like, in the trilogy. <clears throat> oh yeah, the uh, trilogy in five parts. Yeah. <laughs> I just like the fact that I, I got Dad into the um, Terry Pratchett, and he and Douglas Adams have a very interesting way of communicating. They take a very complex idea, distill it down to its base parts, and impart the knowledge very simply and easily. Mm. So it's really good. Um, but the same thing kind of happens in the Forever War. It's like, yeah, he'll like this one, where they've actually taken something that makes sense, a scientific thing. It's like, all right relativity like that's how it works to them it seems like four months have gone by but every time they come back it's a few hundred years it, it's it's amazing mm. like I, I don't even want to talk about it simply because like there, there's books I like and then there's stuff like the forever war where it's like this this book is really special like mm. you should read it like apps like I know a lot of people like old sci-fi books don't hold up as well like even I say like I know a lot of people really like Neuromancer mm. I, I can't truck with it because it, it's so like, I'm loop. thinking about what the future's gonna be and you didn't get it yeah. uh, we last week we oh. mentioned uh, Ender's Game uh, and mm, yeah. there's five or six books in that series and the, the second mm. one follows Ender after the whole Ender War yeah. uh, titled Speaker for the Dead I don't know if either of you have yeah. read that I have and 
taking that whole series and going in a completely different direction. I thought it was yeah. something I hadn't read in a whole lot of other books. Normally it's, oh, well, this is an mm. action series, so it's all going to continue being action. And it's not. It is yeah, well yep. worth a read for a very big change of pace. Yeah. I enjoyed that like, one. It's really hard to recommend because it's like, this first book is very different. And if you got into it because of the first book, you might not like the rest, but the rest is still really good. Mm. Well, it's one of those weird things. Recently, there was a, a bloke on A Current Affair here in Australia uh, whose friend asked him to, as he was, or when he was dying of cancer, to, at his funeral, read out a piece of paper. And it reminded mm. me very much of Speaker for the Dead. And so during the ceremony, yeah. he spoke up, he stood up in the middle of it all, told everyone else to shut the fuck up and read out this little note. And it was saying how his best friend, who was up giving a, a eulogy, had been sleeping with his wife, who was sitting in the front row, and Ooh. just went through, like, he knew everything. And just, this is a note, I'm reading it out, everyone else can shut the fuck up, and this is the way it is. And since then, he's started a business. Mm. So if you're on your deathbed or you have something to say that you want read out at your funeral, he'll go there and do it. And he's, yeah, <laughs> he's done everything from confessions to pointing people out or <clears throat> stating the truth of certain events. And yeah, he that, cops a lot of flack for amazing. it, but he's oh, literally yeah. a speaker for the dead. And oh, it yeah. is just such an interesting thing to have happen yeah I kind of want to really find is. one of these things like I'm assuming someone's recorded at least one. Oh, can you imagine being in the funeral and going oh my god the dearly beloved's gone this bloke stands up and you're going oh shit this is about to get real <laughs> like, you can almost hear the record scratch <laughs> I mean, like what what <laughs> what was like, got- if it happened at my like, uh, funeral for me it was like drama oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> if this day wasn't dramatic enough already holy jeebus well I mean it's going to get more dramatic because as he gets known as the person who does yeah. this, he's not going to be able to show up to the funeral. He's going to have to, like, wait somewhere else for a little bit and then sort of, like, burst in. <laughs> a Kramer. He's got something hey. like a master of disguise. He just starts doing, like, uh, special effects workshops to make him look, like, different. Or just sits in the middle of the crowd <laughs> like, with, like, the, the fake glasses and the funny nose in hmm. there. I'm not me. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was me all along. <laughs> It's like process servers, and what they have to do is like, oh, it's like, are you this person? No. God damn it. You can't look like a process server. You gotta look like someone different. Uh, well, we've made it over an hour, so I think it's Alrighty. time to wrap things up for this week. Well, shit. All right, guys. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Cheers, mate. Have a good one. Have yourselves a good one. See you next time.